Hello, welcome to VMC. I'm Dr. M. Today we are going to cover the topic of raw pet foods. Join me, you'll learn something. So I understand that for some people this is a very hot button sort of a topic and we are going to cover the actual facts surrounding this sort of feeding for our pets. And it's very important that when we are considering all of these things and looking at recommendations from various people that we remember to look for what experts are saying. The veterinary nutritionists are the experts here. This means that they are the ones that we need to be listening to and we also need to look at the consensus statements surrounding these sorts of subjects because uh, when there is a group of actual experts who get together that is much 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 more likely to be accurate and true compared to a lone dissenting voice or just a couple of dissenting voices uh, of people who are not experts and who often don't have any real pet nutrition training at all. So the first concern that we're going to cover is the fact that these recipes are not complete and balanced nutrition. And we have several studies that look into this. Sometimes they're also actually overdoing certain nutrients. And that's a huge concern because um, over time, feeding nutrition that is not balanced can cause many issues with immune system, with bone formation, with growth. These diets are dangerous because they are not balanced. Another fairly common issue is that we often see patients with hyperparathyroidism and so what ends up happening is that from the meat that these animals are being given they are ingesting thyroid and that is resulting in their bodies having an elevated thyroid level which is dangerous for them and in the studies done on this concern all of the animals returned to normal thyroid function once their diets were switched to something appropriate. Next we have to consider the safety risks around these sorts of diets and I do not say this lightly. Feeding a raw diet is a public health safety risk. It is also a safety risk to the individual animal. And part of the oath that veterinarians take when we start practicing is that we will use our knowledge not only to protect and help animals, but also to protect the human species that interacts with the animals that we're treating on a regular basis. We have so many studies on this. Um, these diets are regularly contaminated with salmonella, with E. coli, with toxoplasmosis, with clostridium, with campylobacter, with listeria, and on and on and on it goes. The contamination risks are extremely high. Some proponents of feeding this way lie and say, well, that's okay because cats and dogs are immune to these infections, which is simply not true. Every year I lose patients to these infections from their diets. And what's horrifying is that these people, well, they're risking their pets' lives for no reason, but they're also risking the lives of every single person who comes into contact with their pet. And that is a big problem. All of them are at an increased risk of contracting one of these contaminants from their pet. The fact is that these issues can and do kill people every year. And so feeding a diet that risks this is just not acceptable. Um, there are also risks to pregnant people, especially with Toxo, um, people that are pregnant and that come into contact with a cat who is carrying Toxo can see significant issues um, with the fetus that they're carrying and in adults that are in contact with toxo they can die from it because of severe encephalitis 
We have studies that feeding raw meat to cats increases the toxoplasmosis seroprevalent in those cats and therefore that increases the risks to the people around them. Some people will go, but wolves eat this and what they don't appear to realize is that we have selectively bred dogs over thousands of years and that dogs are not wolves. We have researched that their GI tracts are different, that they have different digestive enzymes than wolves do. We also now expect our dogs to live decades, um, whereas a wolf in the wild maybe lives a handful of years. And part of this is because we now have much better nutrition that is suited for how our dogs have evolved alongside the humans that they keep company. I also frequently hear the excuse, especially for cats, that they're carnivores, so they need to eat this sort of a diet. So let's back up a step here because uh, dogs, in fact, are omnivores. They do not require meat in, at all in order to maintain a healthy life. So a dog can be fed a vegetarian diet and do well with that because they do not need any amino acids from their diet. When we move on to consider cats, they are what we consider an obligate carnivore. What it means is that they require some meat because they require nutrients from that meat and their body is unable to make it on its own. The most common amino acid that people have heard of in regard to cats is taurine, but they also need arachidonic acid and arginine and retinol. And the only way that they can get them is from eating the flesh of other animals. This doesn't mean their diet must only be animal flesh. It means that a certain amount of their diet must be meat-based. So you cannot feed a cat a vegetarian diet. And that is why the WSAVA compliant diets for dogs have a different nutrient makeup than they do for cats, because there has been a lot of research in this area and the veterinary nutritionists know about these feline requirements and the formulas are being tested to prove the bioavailability of the micronutrients. And the nutrition is formulated for optimal use from a feline body compared to like a canine body. So as a summary, just because an animal is considered a carnivore does not mean that they can't eat carbs or grasses or vegetables. It just means that that cannot make up their entire diet. They require animal flesh and they are able to digest carbohydrates. Some people claim that cooking pet nutrition is abhorrent because it destroys the digestive enzymes. <sighs> this frustrates me so much. All the enzymes that our pets need to digest food is in their GI tract. That's what the GI tract does. That's its job. You don't need digestive enzymes from your food. And if somebody is telling you that you do, they clearly do not grasp basic biology. I do want to mention that feeding bones, whether cooked bones or raw bones, is not ever advised. These bones frequently cause tooth fractures, which is very painful. They also often damage the GI tract. Shards can uh, puncture the GI tract, which often results in the death of the animal. And bones very, 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 very often cause obstructions that require surgery. And so for our cats and dogs, do not give them bones. This is a dangerous thing to do, and it is not in their best interest. If a dog enjoys licking out like the middle of a bone, a much more appropriate and safer alternative would be to get a Kong or a Topple, stuff it with canned food, or you can even add some kibble in there and throw that in the freezer and then give that to your dog to lick out. That will be a much safer and healthier option for them. Proponents of raw food diets claim that they are safe and natural, but in reality, they are ignoring 
a large body of research that proves the exact opposite. There's not a single research study that has concluded that feeding a raw diet is more beneficial to the animal in any way. And so the best recommendation is to feed a WSAVA compliant diet. I have gone over what those standards are. I'll link that video here and put it in the description below. It also needs to be noted that freezing and freeze drying items is not an appropriate way to try to preserve them. Those methodologies are actually often used when we want to preserve things like salmonella and E. coli and other infections. And so you should not be feeding freeze dried or frozen items to your pets either. This includes uh, pig ears, bully sticks, you know, those freeze dried treats that you can find. Do not feed them. The risk of contamination is incredibly high. If you are wanting to try to slow down dental disease, I've done a video on that as well. And I go over the things that you can give to your pets to slow down dental disease. And I'll, I'll link that video in the description box below. The last thing that I'm going to cover are the consensus statements from a host of organizations about feeding a raw diet. AHA, the AVMA, the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association, the FDA, and the American College of Veterinary Nutritionists all have position statements saying that feeding a raw food diet is not appropriate, it is dangerous to the pet, it is dangerous to the public, and we cannot be doing this for our pets. These are strongly worded consensus statements because the evidence is so very conclusive. There is zero benefit and there are tons of incredibly well-documented risks. So it is for this reason that I urge you to check out my previous videos on what the WSEBA standards are and to find a nutrition that meets those standards. Alternatively, you can look at my home cooking pet food video. There are a number of very serious pitfalls that you need to avoid if you're going to consider that, but it links to a couple of reputable sources as well as to how you can find a veterinary nutritionist to help you if that's something you're very serious about pursuing. There is absolutely no reason not to be cooking the food that our pets eat is much safer for them, is much safer for us. If I can get you to be cooking what you're feeding your pet and feeding a balanced nutrition, then I'm going to be happy. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me on today's video. I hope that you've learned something today and I hope you will join me on the next one. All right, we'll see you then. Bye.